Monday, June 12th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight we continue our series on how computers work with part two, binary logic and logic gates. Let's do this. You know, I don't think we're ever going to have a free weekend again in the rest of our lives. According to Google, the Google Calendar, we're not going to be free for a month, but the weeks preceding Oticon, we don't have anything yet. Yeah, so anyway, for anyone who didn't listen to Thursday's episode when we decided to do this, we had our friend Yuko come over this weekend, and then we went to the Mocha Art Festival in the city. Hooray! And now someone in the forums posted after our Philly Wizard World coverage, and he had kind of a scathing rebuttal, which I kind of disagree with. Well, actually, I really disagree with. And all I really want to say now is that the Mocha Art Festival was a complete 180 from Philly Wizard World. And we'll talk about this more on Wednesday when we cover that convention and all the fun things we did there and all the awesome It's not comics. really a convention. It's more of an arts festival. It's, really. Imagine a, a comic convention that is nothing but an artist alley. And yeah, there panels. was not a superhero to be seen. Uh, there were a few. There was one guy drawing uh, some Colossus things. Oh, was there? I didn't see. Yeah, he had an area where he was drawing like Marvel sketches. It was mostly artists who don't really work for the big comic companies showing off their stuff. I mean, you saw stuff ranging from a guy made some copies of a stick figure at Kinko's, literally, to, you know, Scott Pilgrim type stuff. Scott Pilgrim is awesome. The Owly guy. Owly is also awesome. And awesome web comics of awesome. But suffice to say, it was awesome and... I really, the only comic culture I seem to dislike is the underwear pervert culture. Un- everyone, does everyone know about underwear perverts? Okay, this is, a, this is a joke from the website Boing Boing, where there was a news story that DC and Marvel had sort of trademarked the word superhero and super hyphen hero. And this actually was a news story from like the 70s, but it was rediscovered recently and spread around the internet, so it became common knowledge. And when Boing Boing found out about it, they said, fine, we won't say superhero. We're going to say underwear pervert. And it really stuck with us. Yeah, they just keep saying underwear pervert on that website. So now we're going to say underwear pervert instead of superhero. Now, of course, some superheroes do not fall into the underwear pervert category, like uh, the guy in Ex Machina or the Watchmen. Yep. They're all well, some of the watchmen are underwear perverts. Well yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in a more literal sense. Yes, yes, very much so. <laughs> anyway, we'll have our coverage of that on Wednesday. Being... Plus uh manga is not without its underwear perverts. No, it Especially is Especially Mega Tokyo, <laughs> which is currently about <laughs> underwear perverts. <laughs> Yeah. I use the words in both meanings. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Uh, we have quite a pile of swag. We, I didn't actually do any interviews at the conve- at the art festival. It was Mostly, too loud and too crowded. It was loud and crowded. And the funny thing is, unlike Philly Wizard World, where no one would interview with me, people were practically begging me to be interviewed. They'd be like, oh, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Uh, I can't. Oh, let's, let's do it now. Come on. Let me say something. But it's not that day, so we'll hold off. I mean, it's tech day. I got so much news, I don't know which news to do. So we might be loaded for a few weeks. Hopefully nothing will happen in the, in the upcoming days. Yeah. I'll be able to unload all this news. Um, the news I want to talk about today has to do with Apple, iTunes, and Northern Europe. Ah, Northern Europe, that bastion of freedom. You know, Sweden, Denmark, Norway mostly, those three. Yeah, I wasn't being sarcastic. Yep. Um... Apparently, the iTunes agreement, you know, the thing that says, I agree, you know, the EULA. End user license agreement. Yeah, that. The thing you click on every time you install software that none of you read and no one cares about. Apparently, the people are arguing that the end user license agreement of iTunes and the iTunes music store is illegal in Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Now, why, Scott, is that? Well, as you know, some contract there are some things people cannot legally contractually agree to do. I could not write a contract that says Rim agrees to be my slave, and if Rim signs it, he doesn't become my slave because it's illegal to hold a slave. In the same way, these people are arguing that in these countries, it is okay to circumvent DRM in the way that the, D- the DMCA prevents. And the uh, iTunes Music Store says you agree not to circumvent the DRM. So you cannot legally agree to give up 
you know, something you can legally do. Now, I don't know how the legal system works over there. I think it's a professional judge type of thing. Well, I'm just saying in terms of contract yeah. law, here in the U.S., it is not illegal to enter into an illegal contract. The way it works is if you sign a contract that violates your rights as the signer, it is illegal to enforce the contract. So basically, if you know a contract is illegal and you go ahead and sign it, they can't really do anything to you and they can't enact the contract. So if, say, there were a EULA situation where the EULA was illegal here, you know, say we got rid of the DMCA and we had some right to DRM breaking, then iTunes wouldn't be in any trouble because they can have that EULA and you're free to agree to it, but they can't enforce it. I don't know what the situation is over there, but it looks bad for I Apple. don't know either. I could probably go to Grok Law and find all, out all about it, but I'm not going to bother. The point is, is that they might, everyone, basically the way it's happening, first they tried in France and they failed. What people are trying to do is they're trying to find some country in which the iTunes DRM and is crap. And that way they can force they can either force Apple to stop doing business in that country or they can force Apple to disclose the DRM or have an iTunes music store in one country that doesn't have DRM. And as soon as they do that, we can all get Denmarkian credit cards and start using iTunes Denmark and get music that way. Yep, which would probably not technically be illegal. So any of those results is a good one because if they can force Apple out of a country, they can keep forcing Apple out of other countries until Apple either gets rid of the DRM or is forced to disclose the DRMs to some country. Because as soon as they disclose it to one country, they disclose it to everyone. Yep, and even if it remains illegal to break it in countries like the United States... I can guarantee that there would be a website in whatever country said it was legal that would have everything you need to break it. Yep. I mean, it's already kind of broken. But <laughs> the point is, is, you know, maybe in that country they'll sell iPods that don't have DRM and then they'll, someone will take the firmware and put it online and we can all flash our iPods so that they don't do the DRM thing. And there's all kinds of stuff. Yep. Of so, course, uh, in addition to that, while we were in the city, we didn't actually go to see it, but apparently there were protests about drm and apple and everything yeah there was a it was like countrywide protests at all the apple stores and someone lied to me and told me that i knew it was on fifth avenue because it's the fifth avenue apple store someone lied i don't know where or who and they told me it was near the empire state building on fifth avenue well they were wrong it's on <laughs> 5th and 59th so on friday microsoft announced that they are or prematurely dropping support for Windows 98. Well, when were they supposed to do that? I don't actually know, but technically Windows 98 and Windows Millennium are still supported. Oh, really? Now, apparently one of the recent vulnerabilities that's come out, uh, I forget exactly which one, and I'm not going to bother look it up because none of you care, but Microsoft basically said that it would be not worthwhile for them to go through the effort of rewriting extensive amounts of code in order to fix it. Therefore, as of Friday, Windows 98 is permanently and irrevocably insecure. Well, I mean, isn't Windows 2000 already in that situation? Uh, not really. There are still updates coming for Windows 2000. Oh. Not full updates, not, but there are still patches available for Windows 2000. Oh, I thought that Windows 2000 was no longer supported. Well, remember, there's different levels of support with Microsoft. Like, Windows XP is fully supported. There are companies that are still getting support for Windows 2000. Uh -huh. In fact, like IBM was in that situation. Until very recently, there was still support for OS 2. And now there's not. But Windows 98 is done now. I, I urge anyone out there who is using Windows 98 to get off of it because there is no way to protect yourself from future vulnerabilities at all. Well, the only thing I can say is if you want to use... The only use I see for Windows 98, and it really only has one use... DOS gaming? No, DOS gaming can be done with FreeDOS or something like that. Or DOSBox, which is almost perfect. All right, then what do you got? Uh, there are old games, Windows games, that really only work in Windows 98. There aren't many, but there are some. Though I will note that almost any program that just works in Windows 98 natively will probably work okay in Wine. Uh, most of them work okay in Wine. Most of them work okay in XP. But there are some, that very few, but there are some that really only work in 98, 95. A lot of times they're ones that really work in Windows 3.1, and the Windows 98 is really good at playing those, even if it, they can also work in Wine or something. If you're doing that, don't plug that computer into a network. Yeah, good God. <laughs> just, just have a little Windows 98 computer to play your games, and don't plug it into anything. And on a broader level, I just want to note to people that 
This will always happen to Microsoft products. Yep. You will always reach a point at which the operating system you're using is not easily upgradable, or if it might even be impossible to upgrade, and it will no longer be secure or supported. And there's really no way around that. I mean, there are Linux distros that died or that don't get their own updates anymore, but theoretically, you could find someone to write them for you or write them yourself. There's absolutely no way to do that with Windows. For an example, the new Ubuntu Dapper Drake will be supported for five years on the server and three years on the desktop after its release. That means if you set up an Ubuntu server right now, well, I guess since a few weeks ago when Dapper Drake was released, so in 2011, there will still be updates for security on Ubuntu Dapper Drake. Not only that, but every version of Ubuntu, Ubuntu now, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, will is always upgradable to the next version. Yes, but the point is is that if you set up a system on a server with Ubuntu Dapper Drake, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Dapper Drake, you can stick with Dapper Drake and have a stable, unchanging platform for five years with no worries. Previous versions of Ubuntu, Ubuntu. had a much shorter time of, of where there would be updates. Even the new Ubuntu desktop has three years of updates coming to it. And of course, you can always just upgrade to the next version beyond Dapper Drake, which would probably be like, I don't know, easy something and then furry ficus. Ficus? I don't know. It can't be a tree. I don't know what they are, but I could go look up what they're going to (laughs) be. Something that begins with E and then something that begins with F. But also, the upgrade chain will be mostly indefinite. I mean, Windows, say you had Windows 98 or Windows 95 and you can upgrade to Windows 98 and you can theoretically upgrade that to Windows 2000. And you can theoretically maybe upgrade that to XP. Or not XP, uh, Vista. I dare you to just take a clean computer, install Windows 95, uh, use a 98 upgrade CD, then use a 2000 upgrade CD. You know what? Not even that. Take a Windows 98 computer and upgrade it to Windows 2000 and see what happens. Many of you out there are younger and didn't live through that, but it didn't work. No, not really, because you were switching from the Win32 kernel to the NT kernel. It just didn't work at all, and things broke, and it just made a mess. I mean, <laughs> the, the one that works best is upgrading a 2000 to an XP, and even that's kind of crappy. Really crappy. Yeah. It, it really just sucks. If you want to upgrade, let's say you were using, what was it, the uh, Breezy Badger? Yep. Uh, if you want to upgrade that to the Dapper Drake... You type, what, one thing? Well, you two type, things. You two type things. in, like, very few things, and it just kind of happens. And then you reboot the computer. Yep. Of and course, if you're using, like, a Gen 2 Linux, you just compile stuff constantly. Oh, yeah. Gen 2 is basically updates for all eternity. Yep. It's not really versioned or anything. You just keep adding updates. And there, if you install it at a certain date, and then a year later, if you keep doing the updates, you'll have the same thing that someone who just installed it will have. Mm-hmm. For the most part. Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. Every now and then things change, but that's how there, the world there's is. There's some stuff with profiles, but I don't want to get into that. Yeah. And we won't get into how Macs work, other than the fact that, um, yeah, I'm probably going to buy one right after this show. Yeah, we'll see. We'll uh, see. Yeah. Well, it, coincidentally, the main reason I was holding off is that until recently, I was not terribly financially secure. Uh, so you mean something changed between yesterday and today? Well, I did something changed that I didn't realize changed. When I looked and noticed that my car is pretty much paid off, which means my insurance is going to go away. And coincidentally, two days ago, I one, got a new credit card, and two, my old credit card doubled my limit randomly because they saw that I'm being prosperous. Mm-hmm. And all of those factors could together really are pushing Rim toward buying all the gadgets he hasn't bought for a while because he was trying to be responsible and was, for some reason, talking in the third person. And it has nothing to do with, you know, the the intensive peer pressure campaign, camp, you know. Well, it also has something to do with the fact that of my computer's four USB ports, one of them is still functioning. What happened to Mr. I'm going to use this computer till it dies? You know what? I am. I'm turning this computer into a Windows terminal server. (laughs) But that's beside the point. What happened to, uh, as long as this thing works, I'll use it no matter what? Um, Or, why should I buy a Mac when I could get a fast enough computer for less? Well, here's the other thing. The Mac is real cheap. And I can run GarageBand. And one thing that really got me was, I wanted to buy an an MP3 player, because it's about time for me to get one. And the only advantage the iPod has 
is that it works cool with iTunes and does all that fun stuff. If I'm running Linux, there's no way to access any of that stuff, so I might as well buy some cheapo MP3 player. But then what happened to, I'm going to switch to Windows, screw Linux. Yeah, and I've I've switched back and forth a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah, why is that? Because I waffle a lot. No, waffler. Because I I, I take my time making decisions, and I'm always my own devil's advocate. I see, I see, we just got you to admit to the waffling. Yeah, I'm a waffle, and you know what? I like waffles. You know what? I'm a pancake, so fuck you. (laughs) That didn't make any sense at all. (laughs) That's the point. (laughs) But yeah, there's a distinct possibility by next week we'll be doing this on a Mac. Hooray. I didn't have to pay for it. Yeah, but that means you don't get to play with it either. I don't need to play with it. You can just buy one, too. You kind of need a new computer. They're real cheap. We could buy two. There's a- <laughs> My computer has nothing wrong with it. It's slow. What are you talking Ish. about? It plays Half-Life 2 fine. You can't use GarageBand. I don't need GarageBand if you have it. Why not? We can both have it. What am I going to do with it? You could sometimes do the post-production when I go to bed. Uh, no. Nah. How can I do that? Why not? Just learn how to do it. Why should I spend my time doing that shit? <laughs> I'm busy playing Half-Life 2. Yeah, great. On my perfectly working computer. Yeah. Well, I saw that fan that wasn't spinning started spinning again. Yeah. I can't, I f- my, my computer's getting better, not worse. Meanwhile, my computer, a while ago, the case fan started making noise. And I solved that pretty quickly by unplugging the case fan. Good job. And my Northbridge fan started making some noise. So I solved that in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Computer's still okay, mostly because I have an air conditioner, but <laughs> <laughs> which isn't on. Well, because it's kind of nice out right it's, now. It's your computer's surviving because you took the panel off the side of the case. Yep. Let's see. The live drive is dead because the cable inside. The live drive has been dead for years. Yes, it has. The zip drive is dead, which is it's fine. also been dead for years. The zip drive I never used. The D- the CD burner. Now I bought a Plextor SCSI CD burner before CDRW was available to the public. This burner is old as shit, and it doesn't work anymore. My DVD-ROM is so old it can't read dual-layered DVDs. All right. It also cost me a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I'm running a, an overheating old Thunderbird gigahertz. Yeah. So- I love this computer. <laughs> Forget the Mac. I'll just keep this. God damn it. <laughs> Itakola suichi. I don't know if you said that right at all. It sounded about right. It's close. It sounds close enough. I don't know. It probably isn't right. It's probably horribly mangled. For all we know, you could have just said something like, I rate babies. I'm pretty sure I got all the syllables right. But anyway, this is a video of a whole bunch of Rube Goldberg machines from a Japanese children's show. They are of the highest quality, and apparently they've been on the net for a while, but this weekend, Yuko... One, freaked out when she realized that we hadn't seen them, and then showed them to us. It really reminds me of uh, the PBS kid shows that I watched when I was a little kid. Yeah. Like, not the PBS shit they have on now, but old school Sesame... The stuff that would be in between the Sesame Street stuff on the old Sesame Street, you know? Now, this may be a kid show, but these Rube Goldberg devices are of the highest quality. Okay, so the security consulting company, which means what they do is if you have a business and you have computers and you don't know if they're secure, you hire the consulting company, they come and try to hack into you, and they tell you what they did and if they succeeded, and then they fix the holes for you, or at least tell you how to fix the holes. So one security consulting company was going to test, I think, a bank, I don't know, for social engineering weaknesses. Now, that is my favorite kind of hacking. That doesn't require any technical skill at all. That is when you convince other people to give you what you want. Yep. So the company went to all the employees and said, we're the security consultants. Sometime soon, we are going to socially engineer you. Be on the lookout. So now, not all, so that way, you know, it's not just stupid easy. They're, they're fixing the real obvious gaping holes that prepared employees, you know, will fail. Because usually when they do these tests, they don't warn anyone. And then they find out, you know, they just basically do a secret sudden test to figure out who's stupid and who's smart. Yep. Or figure out where the holes are. And generally everyone's stupid when you do that. Here, they were trying to say, all right, if people are know we're coming, how are we going to get in? Well, the answer is just as easily. Yeah. (laughs) It made it not any more difficult to get in. What they did is they took some USB drives 
and they put some software on the USB drives, and they just kind of let them scatter around the parking lot and whatnot. And sure enough, most of those USB drives ended up in company computers rather quickly. Where they then immediately installed their virus payload, and well, Trojan payload, yep. and sent all the personal data from the PC back to the security company so, who then laughed. So you put the thumb drive in the computer, and immediately there's now a key logger and all kinds of evil shit. So now everything the person types is going to the guy who made the thumb drive, you know, and, and that's it. You're done. Now, this is really, I mean, it's a problem with people not realizing the security implications of doing things. It's also a problem with Windows. Mm -hmm. Because if in Linux, or even in Macs, I'm pretty sure, if you just stick a thumb drive in, it's not going to execute anything. No, but in Windows, you can make an auto-run boot dr uh, a thumb drive that'll auto-run. Yep, like an auto-run CD. And administrators often don't disable auto-run on all the computers. And in fact, most people who are running a Windows computer are running it as administrator anyway, so the Trojan now has full access to everything on the PC. Dum-dum-dum. In Linux, you would have to put the thumb drive in, manually run the program, you would see that it was still running after you closed it, you yep. know, and after it does its fake thing. Well, unless you ran it as root and it set up a root kit. Yep. But if you run a strange file as root, you get what you deserve. Yeah, and even if you if you run the strange file executable as user, all it can really do is mangle your user stuff, which screws that user and no one else. And that's really easy to repair. And supposedly the company secrets would not be in the user's My Documents folder, and they would be in some database where they would be well protected. But social engineering is the biggest danger to security, and it's also the one that gets the least press, and most people don't really realize it. Oh, it gets there. plenty of press. It's just people don't understand it. Well, they hear the word, but they don't realize that that means the guy calling on the phone saying it's an emergency and he needs the password because the boss is pissed. Social engineering means someone just walks into your company and asks for the password, and <laughs> idiots just tell him everything he wants to know, and you don't actually have to do any hacking. Yep, or like dressing up as the janitor, or dressing up as an IT guy, walking in, saying you're with the support group, and you got a call that there's something wrong with their computer, or you detect that there's a virus on their computer, and you need your password so you can sit down and fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people just fall for it. Yep. In fact, when I worked for ITS, uh, Information Technology Services at RIT, which was the tech support and IT maintenance for the campus, we had badges that we were required to make a point of showing them to the people we're working on, saying, yes, I am legitimate. Because apparently not too long before I was hired, two kids walked into an office at RIT, said they were working for ITS, walked off with a bunch of computers and disappeared. Woohoo! One, props to them, and two, goddamn. Yep, 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 yep. But it's really the weakest link in security. No matter how secure anything you make ever is, you really can't account for the stupidity, ignorance, and most importantly, just people not caring. If you're paying someone... It's all about trust. You can't trust idiots. This is why users must be given nothing. Not even just idiots. Say you, you trust someone, they're a smart person, but you're paying them seven fifty an hour. They're not going to care so much about the security of whatever they're working on. Well, then you don't really trust them, do you? Nah, or you, you, <laughs> you trust them to be content with seven fifty an hour. And then you get what you deserve. <laughs> well, that, that was bad trusting. You got to be good about trusting. And you got to not have idiots. But anyway, we would like today to continue our ongoing series on how computers work. From the barest of bits to the highest end complexities of awesome. Now, a lot of people gave us some useful feedback saying we went too fast, so we're going to review. Yes. Now, in essence, all we really explained on our previous segment of this, this is segment number two, is that computers are deterministic, mm -hmm. i.e., that, well, e.g., that they are predictable. Yes. No, yeah, i.e., i.e., not e.g., i.e. A computer is input, processing, and output. The same input will always result in the same output with the same computer. If a simple computer only had one thing in it, you could either, you'd either push a button or not push a button. And if you push a button, a light comes on. If you don't push a button, the light doesn't come on. You know that any time you push that button, it will always come on. The light will always come on. The computer is the same way. It just has a lot more buttons and a lot more lights. Now, this has broad implications. Not only is it mathematically significant... But it's also significant all the way up to the user level. If there is something wrong with the computer, 
it is your fault because the computer will always do the same thing with the same input. So if it is not your fault, then it is the fault of whoever wrote the software. But or then the computer is because the software is also input, but we'll get to that. Yeah. But a computer is the same thing no matter what. It doesn't change unless it's broken. It could be a broken computer. If you want some interesting reading, try reading about Turing machines or... Uh, Which we will explain at some point in the future. Yes, I was going to read a nice excerpt from Diamond Age that actually goes over it pretty well, but apparently Scott lent my copy of Diamond Age to our friend Kate. Yeah, I told you I was letting her borrow it. And, and I th- totally forgot. And then you forgot and I also forgot. Yeah. So... <laughs> Luckily she reminded us in the forums. Yep. But that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. That's, we, we'll get it later. It's a really good book if you didn't read Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson. Read that. Yes. And Snow Crash also. Yes, and basically... In fact, require, those, are, those are the textbooks for Rim and Scott's How Do Computers Work. The textbooks are Snow Crash and Diamond Age. Yes. And every, let's see, everything by Neil Stevenson, everything by William Gibson. <laughs> no, no. Oh, the only other textbook besides those two is um, C Programming by uh, Richie. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't bother with that. <laughs> Unless you want to learn how to write C. But anyway, and then we talked about how input in a computer, I mean, everyone, it's binary, it's ones and zeros, true and false, yes or no, on or off, they're all the same thing. Electricity or not electricity. Or some variation therein. Mm -hmm. But it is all just yeses and nos. A whole ton, billions and billions of yeses and nos. That's it. That's all that goes on in there. Yeses come in, nos come out, who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Now... The way that these yeses and noes become output, or at least usable output, deterministic output, is by applying logic to them. Mm-hmm. We talked briefly about the transistor, and now all that does is you can now use an electrical signal, a yes or a no, in order to determine whether or not a different electrical signal will be a yes or a no. Mm-hmm. So you can look at one bit or one piece of information or one wire, and based on what's on that wire, you have a thing that says, if there's something on that wire, then I will put something on this wire too. Yep. So there's a little transistor, and it's got wires coming in and out of it. And it looks at the wires coming in to see if they have electricity or if they don't have electricity. And if they do have electricity, then on the out wire, it either sends electricity or doesn't, depending. And if they don't have electricity, it either sends electricity or not, depending. Now, if we break this down to the simplest form... Imagine that on, that you have two inputs, two wires. Each can have either yes or no. Electricity or not electricity. From now on, we'll always refer to them as one or zero. Yes. Because yes, that makes will. it easier. Yes. But just remember that one is not a thing. One is just a word that we use to mean electricity. Yes, there are not little magic ones and zeros floating around in there. I think I explained that last time. Yes. But reiteration is always good, especially when people think you're moving too fast. Now... These, say we have two inputs, two wires. I, either of them can have a one or a zero. Now, so that's four combinations total. Now, you can have logic there. Say we have a little back, a magic box, and the two wires come in, and one wire comes out. And say, for every combination of ones and zeros that can go in the two inputs, a different output comes out, or an output that we can determine. Mm-hmm. That is logic. No yep. ma- if If... If you say whenever both of the inputs are one, then the output will be one no matter what, then that is deterministic and it will always be one if the two inputs are one. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many different logical operators you can use, and those are all the different boxes or gates that you can use. Yep. I mean, a computer has countless inputs, more inputs than you can fathom, and more outputs than you can fathom. And we'll explain that in the future. I mean, for the sense of scale, look at your computer monitor. You see all those pixels? Imagine that each one of those is one output. It's actually more complicated than that. Every one of those pixels is a whole ton of outputs from a whole ton of logical little boxes with little wires coming in. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. They just keep going. There's so many of them in there. But the basic unit is one single digital logic operator. Yep, because it turns out that despite the millions and countless infinite combinations of inputs that can produce different outputs, you can break them all down into a tiny set of little two-input logical magic boxes that combining these in various ways can create any logic you could ever imagine. Except you need one more thing, which we'll talk about later. Yes, but in terms of, well, in terms of a one-step operator. Yes, one a, step. In terms of one input, one output. 
at any given time. Well, two inputs, one output. Well, one set of input, one set of output. Right. You can create any Boolean logic, any logic in the world just from this small subset of gates. Mm -hmm. Logic gates. Yep. The logic gate is just the magic box that I described. Yep. Now let's talk about the different boxes. The simplest box to understand is the AND gate. The AND gate has, of course, two wires coming in and one wire going out. The one wire going out will never have electricity on it, except if the two wires coming in both have electricity. So if input 1, if input A is 1 and input B is also 1, so if input you know, it's 1 and 1, then a 1 will come out. See, AND gate, 1 and 1. Yep, the, the names are very descriptive. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say the two inputs to an AND gate were 1 and 0, or 0 and 0, or 0 and 1, which is pretty much the only other three combinations you can have, yep. a 0 will come out of that AND gate. But if two 1s come into the AND gate, then a 1 will come out. That is an AND gate. That is now, very simple. I've linked to, in the post, a nice, probably Wikipedia description of all these gates with pictures and diagrams and all sorts of things. So I highly encourage you, if you're listening at a computer, to look over those diagrams while we speak. It'll make it a lot easier. There are also symbols for each gate. I think an AND gate is sort of a square with a rounded edge. Yeah, I don't think trying to describe them over a podcast. That's not going to work, well. no. But there is a different symbol for each gate, and they're pretty simple, and learning them will help you. Now, in terms of understanding these gates, keep in mind that there's only two inputs to each one, with one special exception. We'll get to that. Yep. Therefore... There are only four possible inputs mm -hmm. total, four possible combinations of input for each one. Yep. So if you want to get them straight and learn them and understand them, you can make what's called a truth table, where you list the four possible inputs on one side across the bottom, and then across the top in a little square, you list the possible outputs. Mm -hmm. And then you can make a little grid, and in the link it shows exactly what these look like. And you can use that, if you don't remember what a gate does, to figure out exactly how the gate works. Mm -hmm. And I just want—I can't reiterate enough that everything your computer does, with one tiny, with one exception that we'll talk about another day, is just combinations of these gates. Yep. So the next gate, we'll talk about the OR gate. Now the OR gate will only put out a one if either input A is one, or if input B is one, or if they're both one. Yep. It's an OR gate. So the only time, so an OR gate, pretty much always has a, like a one coming out of the one output, except if both of the inputs to the OR gate are zero, then and only then will the OR gate output zero. Now, see, it seems very intuitive. And if, if A and B are true, then C is true. Or if A or B is true, then C is true. Mm -hmm. These are just electrical representations of Boolean logic, which yep. you can read up on Boolean logic in great detail online. Or you can take a discrete math course in school. And then you'll learn to hate it. Now, here's the real simple one is the NOT gate. The NOT gate actually only has one input and one output. What it does is it outputs the exact opposite of the input. It's often called an inverter. Yep. Now, the, if, the reason it's called NOT is you say, is the input NOT 1? If the answer is yes, then a 1 comes out. Yep. So if the input is not 1, what is it? It's 0. Mm -hmm. And if the input is 0, then the output is 1. Yep. It's the an inverter. output is always the opposite of the input. 0 comes in, 1 comes out. One it inverts comes in, the signal. Zeros it, come out. It flips the signal, it reverses the signal, however you want to think about it. And it only it's the only it's the only gate that has only one input. It doesn't have two inputs like the other gates. Okay, let's talk about the NAND gate. Yeah, with the the basic gates not and or. Yes. Now, well, there's also one more kind of basic gate. Yeah, but we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, now you can combine not gates with and or or gates to make two cool kind of gates. Mm -hmm. NAND and NOR. Not and, not or. A, so it, N-A-N-D, not and. It basically is the same thing as an AND gate, only it takes the output and puts it through a not gate. So imagine it in English, if it is not and, if, if, the, if it is not true in an and gate, then it is true here. And if it is true in an and gate, then it is false here. 
So it only it outputs a one as long as the two inputs are not both one. Yeah, remember an AND gate only puts out a one if both inputs are one. On a NAND gate, it always outputs a one unless both inputs are one. Then it will output a zero. Now, trivia with the NAND gate, and I know someone answered in the forums, which I'm very happy about. And we talked about it last time, too, but we'll talk about yes. it again. The NAND gate just happens to be, electrically, the simplest gate to make. It just happens. It is very, very simple, and in fact, with nothing but the electronics from NAND gates, you can create every other gate that exists. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because if you take the two inputs of a NAND gate and short them together, it becomes a NOT gate. Because think about it. Say you have one input that then splits into the two inputs of a NAND gate. If you put a 1 into that one wire, no matter what, a 1 goes into both sides, which then makes it false, which does the same thing as a NOT gate. Mm -hmm. That might make more sense if you look at a picture of it. Yep. There's also the NOR gate, not OR. It follows the same trend as the NAND gate. It's a not OR gate. So if an OR gate would output a 1, the NOR gate outputs a 0, and vice versa. So pretty much a NOR gate always puts out a 0 unless both inputs are 0, in which case it outputs a 1. Now, OR, for now, has been either OR or both. It's been an inclusive OR. When in doubt, it's included. XOR is another gate where the X stands for exclusive, meaning it'll only output a one, a true, if one of the inputs is true, one, and one of the inputs is false. Yeah, XOR is a, is a tricky gate, and it's it's like the advanced gate. <laughs> you know, if you're programming stuff and you're using XORs, it's like, ooh, you were smart enough to use XOR. Think of it like a radio button. Not really, but, <laughs> I mean, any any programmer worth a shit knows when to use XOR. Yeah. But think of it like a radio button. You can only select one at a time. It'll only be true if only one of the inputs is selected, if only one of the inputs is true. Yeah, so imagine you have, uh, there are two inputs. If both of them are the same, then nothing comes out. But if they're different, so if, one in, if input A is 1 and input B is 0, or if input A is 1 and input B is 0, then and only then will you get a 1 to come out of the output. So you can think of it as a, are they not the same gate? Yep, an XOR is, if the inputs are not the same, output a 1. If the inputs are the same, output a 0. Now, of course, there is a N XOR gate. Well, it's an XNOR. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make it easy, because, you know, N AND, N OR, N XOR. Yep, the XNOR gate, or the N XOR gate, the NOT XOR gate, if you will. It will all put a 1... If both gates are, the, if the inputs are the same as each other. So it's a check for sameness. Yep. If both inputs are zero, a one comes out. And if the inputs are different, a zero comes out. And if both inputs are one, a one comes out. And of course, your computer is just for each step that your computer does. Because, you know, you have a processor and it works, a, a, you know, a megahertz, a number of times per second it does something. Every time it does something, it's just a crazy combination of all these gates. Well, that'll be more relevant when we talk about stuff next week. True. But if just you... try to get it in your heads and remember that your computer is only doing, in each iteration, every time it does something, it's just following a complex set of one of these gates, or all these gates, and then an output comes out. Yep, there are lots and lots of inputs to your computer from all over the place, and they, some of them are more than just one bit or a couple bits. There are many, many bits and bytes and megabits and gigabytes. And there's a million inputs, and it goes into all of them at once, and there's a bunch of gates all linked up to each other. And then at the end, there's a whole mess of outputs all over the place. And it's just this sea of gates all linked up to each other all over the place crazy like and a mess of inputs and a mess of outputs and if you give it the same input you'll always get the same output every and, single time and if you have a computer running by itself with absolutely no input from any source anywhere then it can never ever change what it's doing nope unless it was coded to do so in which case it's not actually changing because it's doing exactly what it was told to do Yep. If the program is an input to the computer. Remember that. If you tell a computer to add one and one and then subtract one and one and do that over and over and over again, it'll never stop until someone unplugs it or stops it. Or it breaks. Yeah. If it didn't do that, then it would not be, in fact, a computer. 
All right, I'll ask the trivia question this time. All right. There is something we left out that we said we were going to talk about next time, and we will. Now, you might have noticed that with this lo- these gates we're talking about, there isn't a way for a computer to remember something. Yeah, because you have an, well, if you have an input coming in, then an output is coming out. But as soon as you change the input, the output changes. Yep. Now, nor if you just use these logical things, you can only make a computer that does something right now. You can't make a computer that does something when there are many inputs in a different order. So let's say I had a computer and I inputted, you know, one, two, three. And then I had a computer and I inputted one, three, two. Do you see how the order of the inputs, when there are many inputs in an order, sequential input, makes a difference? Well, in order for that to happen, the computer would have to be able to remember a bit from before, or many bits from before. It would have to remember if something was true or false. It has to store a bit. It has to take a bit of information and hold on to it and not let it go so that when the inputs come through again, that it'll be different. Now, how do you do that when a bit is just electricity? Yep. How do you do that? Well, that's our trivia question. And it's once again, you won't win anything. It is just a way to prepare yourself for the next segment of how computers work. Yep, there are actually many ways to store information, but there is a most basic one to store a single bit. That is the simplest electronic way to do so. And don't just say RAM. Or a hard drive. Yeah. Or a CD or a floppy disk. We're talking about on the lowest, lowest electronic level. If you were soldering a bunch of things together, how would you store something there? Mm Mm-hmm. If you were making a chip, like a Pentium chip, what electronic thing would you put on the chip to store a bit now we announced last week we're done with the computer segment for now that we were finishing up the logo contest and what i can say now is that we have started and then ended a different contest the banner contest for the top of the website well it's not really so much a banner contest as in make the website look a little better contest yeah and you know what i'm sure you all saw classic bry's um Submission in the forum. If you haven't, you should go to the forum. Because the website is probably going to be looking like that in short order. He has won, and we're going to do something awesome for him in return. Yes. Now, his submission did not really include a logo. We are going to need to do some work on our end to select a logo and incorporate it into our... You know, uh, M- feed images and MP3 images. Yep. And I mean, basically, like a brand image. We we started the logo contest and we were real vague about it. And now, especially now that we've talked to more people who know more about this than us, we've realized that we wanted art for the website. That's really cool. That you know, this is Geek Nights. But we then we that has to be something somewhat complex, something that'll look good on the site. Mm-hmm. We still need the logo, which has to be simple. It has to be like almost a. Almost a gestalt, a thing that you look at, and it's that is Geek Nights. It's very simple, very compact, like the logo of a company. Yeah, like McDonald's Golden Arches. We've got a, we've gotten a bunch of awesome submissions, obviously, and we'd like to have more. We're going to extend the contest, but we do no longer really need art for the website itself. Yep. So think simple. It's not going to go on much longer, though. No, it's not. I mean, you should see how many submissions we got right after we said the contest is almost over. Yeah, let's get you got. Um, Two weeks. I was about to say two weeks, so that's two good. Two weeks is good. In two, within two weeks, we will have decided on a Geek Nights logo. So once again, think simple. If you can't draw, I don't know, just make a mock-up of what you think it should look like. And then someone else will draw it. Like, don't even worry about coloring it. Just come up with the idea, and I'm sure we can cover the rest. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows, it's actually recorded at night.